Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. We're back with our friend Kyle. We're going to be going over what's happening in the world of banks and all these failures at the moment, how that can maybe start to kick off some other dominoes and particularly look under the hood into uh, why this is happening and why the solutions might be just band-aid solutions. But welcome back, Kyle. How have you been, mate? Good to be back, mate. Yeah, been doing well. Uh, pretty exciting times at the moment. We, you know, I mean, we were just talking about gold popping off and all the banks in a bit of trouble and... Yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about anyway. Yeah, gold and silver are looking really good like it wants to have a crack and we'll have a look at a few of those charts and a few of those bank stocks you've got for us as well. Um, maybe the US stock market and relate it all back to crypto. But um, I guess just a quick bit of housekeeping. It's been a year since we've, I've been back making videos. So thanks to Kyle and uh, a few other people. We've reassembled a team and uh, 400 odd that have signed back up for our premium research. And I just want to share, um, we've got the website up and running, but we are working on this new portal uh, to get back to how we used to have it with our structured research and, and all that in the feed. And I'm sharing that on screen for everyone at home. Kyle, you'll have your own little uh, TA section in there and um, we'll have some courses in there and everything. So yeah, that's something we've been working on. Hopefully only a few weeks away for people that I know miss that uh, structured research because we've been trying to find the hidden gems and do the write-ups, but I know it does get lost in Facebook mm. after a little while. So that's kind of exciting as well. But um, any thoughts just in general, mate, on on the banks and the things you've been reading and hearing? Um, what do you think the sentiment is, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, to be honest, I think one of the biggest things going on at the moment is obviously, you know, all this all these scares in the banks is crashing the, the stock market and it's causing, you know, the, the SPX to have a pretty big sell-off. And I think, you know, for all of us in the crypto world, one of the biggest changes that I've noticed is that Bitcoin and Ethereum have stopped being very closely paired to the SPX and are now actually very closely correlated to gold and silver. Yeah. Uh, and this also, you might remember, happened in 2019, uh, just after we came out of the accumulation period for Bitcoin as well. So it's interesting to see like we're in the same part of the cycle four years later and that switch between, you know, very correlated to the SPX back to gold and silver is happening at the moment. And, you know, potentially that's being caused by all these banking collapses at the moment that we're seeing in traditional finance industry. And I think that's probably something we even touched on in a video a couple of months ago about how um, tight that correlation was and even to the US dollar and everything and how that could break. And I think it's because of um, the nuances of how this is playing out, like who's getting bailed out and what's happening under the hood. You know, Is it more money, money printing? Is that good for gold and Bitcoin versus, hey, if a lot of these other regionals and, and I still kind of prescribe to this theory that the general economy is probably going to go into some sort of recession uh, average person's not going to be able to keep up with the cost of living and things are going to get really bad in the real economy, but just depends on who they bail out and rescue and where that money printing goes into what assets can get propped up and that kind of thing. I mean, it, even in Australia, we just saw last week that new mortgage scheme where you can buy a house now with your sister or other siblings. And, mm. you know, we spoke about this years ago how housing got unaffordable for an individual and that was two. And what are they going to do next? Make it three or four people on a mortgage. And this is kind of a stepping stone to all that yep. so it's everywhere we look there's um you know in the us i read stats people now borrowing money just to buy their groceries and kind of thing so at the moment it's kind of like this what's going to happen next and if they keep putting these band-aid solutions on it doesn't fix anything it's the big question is yeah wh where is this going and is this all designed as some people like to go down that rabbit hole you know they really want all these little banks to fail um consolidate that power into the big big few that are you know jp morgan already have theirs sort of digital currency, right. JP Morgan coins. Is this just all the stepping stone to roll out central bank digital currency? So have you given that sort of stuff a bit of thought as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's definitely the potential angle that they're deliberately crashing all of the smaller banks so that they can then come in with the solution that is central bank digital currency. Yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe higher level game theory, that's part of it. But we also have to remember as well that uh, and it definitely could be the case, but uh, we have to remember as well that this time last cycle, so 14 years ago in 2008, there was about 400 banks that collapsed. So this is definitely the time in the business cycle where the banks get put under massive amounts of stress and the weaker ones go under. And we haven't seen anything yet compared to 2008. So there could be a lot more to come, which if it is, could be very bullish for gold and Bitcoin. 
Yeah, so in terms of numbers, you're right, we haven't seen anything yet in terms of the number of banks, but um, we have seen the second largest US bank in history in terms of the dollars that went under. And so I think we've already surpassed the amount that have, in terms of the value of the banks that have gone under. But if you adjust that for inflation, it's kind of not there yet. Mm. But if we were to get to those numbers in terms of hundreds of small banks, um, you know, we're sitting on trillions of dollars in in um, everything from the bond losses that they're holding on to commercial real estate, which is another sector we're going to talk mm. about today. And this is kind of the getting to the under the hood of what's happening and how the Fed are rescuing people as well. But he kind of said something interesting before we're talking about small banks and why people... Um, would or wouldn't take their money out and do you want to maybe touch on that again and I'll give some rebuttals I guess yeah yeah for sure so basically I was saying that there's not real incentive for people to be holding their money their capital in smaller banks I mean especially if you're over the 250k limit of you know the FDIC right Um, so because a lot of them as well are offering lower percentage returns on just holding right um, your, your interest payments for just holding in there, especially now with, say, Apple and Goldman Sachs teaming up for 4.1% or something. Why would you keep your money in a you know, higher risk bank, in you know, a re- high risk regional bank for one or 2%? It doesn't really make sense. Yes. So, FDIC, important point you've made there. For people at home that don't understand, those deposits, if you're under 250000 are um, insured. So, then, you know, you're not going to lose your money. But what we're seeing now with these, some of these bigger banks like Silvergate that were involved in the tech industry and mainly had big um, financial sort of loans and deposits, that kind of thing, a lot of them were over that category. And so, they kind of had to bend the rules a bit to, to bail them out. So, we're living in this world now. Are they just going to bail out everyone, no matter how big or small? Um, or are they going to try and make JP Morgan and all these big banks ab- absorb them? And uh, as we, they end up paying them uh, effectively 100 cents on the dollar. So I might dive into that a little bit now as well. But mm-hmm. uh, I think one of the only reasons you might still keep your money in these smaller banks, if you think about it on a personal level, in places like Australia where we see all these regional bank branches closing and, and the there's no ATMs and you might know the person there on first basis and they might have supported your small business. So it's that personal relationship you might have with a smaller bank, yeah. even though they're not um, paying as high interest rate. That you know They're the sort of reasons why um, people might stay that I can think of. You know, trust, they've always been with that. They don't. A lot of people aren't that financially savvy. They don't really know or care if they're getting 3% instead of 4 or 5%. Agreed. And I think that thing as well about um, concentration of power. If all the, we end up with four big banks or, or whatever it is in Australia, America, they're not going to have these regional branches and ATMs, and it just gets harder and harder for the average guy. All of a sudden, they've got to travel in another cost of running that small business. And so, I guess that's probably the only things I can think of. Is there any others uh, that come to mind for you? The small banks versus big bank advantage? Not really. Not like in terms of. I think you nailed all the benefits. It's all about that. You know loyalty to the bank and personal relationship but still like you know well i mean i currently say from my personal opinion for me it just doesn't make any sense to hold large amounts so you know even though we had you know jamie diamond come out and said you know that the 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 banking crisis is most likely over we still saw uh massive withdrawals from of deposits right so uh that's um that that's the that's the thing that we're still seeing is that people are still I think psychologically, even if it doesn't really make sense to withdraw your money because it is FDIC insured, I think there's just that psychological factor of you still don't want your money tied up in a bank that goes under and then, you know, you have to go through the process of FDIC and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's still just that psychological fact and humans act on emotion and fear yes. and they're like, oh, maybe I should just take my money out. So they were still seeing that flight sort of out of those banks and, into a safe, safer space, which is JP Morgan. It just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And then when the banks that all of, everyone moves their money out of go under, JP Morgan just comes in and buys them. So Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that's happened that we've um, both talked about over the years is just the, the inability for certain sectors like crypto, for example, to get banking services with the big players. So they're forced mm. to go to you know a Silvergate in America or a smaller regional bank in Australia. So whether it's, you know, we saw medical marijuana or tattoo parlors, you know, just things that they don't like, they can say no. So all of a sudden, if we get this concentration of power, they now have the decision to decide what sectors of the economy. And we've spoken about this as well, places like Bali going, hey, 
you know, come here, we'll have the the capital and the innovation and we'll lower tax yeah. rates and stuff. So super interesting. I think um, the next 30 years, it's this shift of power from the West to the East and these other developing nations that have a bit more open arms policy to all this stuff rather than just saying, hey, how can we have the most power and roll out these CBDCs to have total control? For sure. And what an interesting point to make about that is Royal Powell has recently been talking a lot about uh, London actually stepping up and being a lot more open to crypto and that it's happened before in the past. And I think he was talking about in the 70s or the 80s, and a lot of companies and a lot of investment banks ended up moving their head offices to the UK. Yeah. And a lot of the time when the, U- the US stumbles, like, you know, smaller, we're seeing now smaller countries or in terms of financial power, um, Indonesia is a massive country, um, you know, sort of picking up that slack. Usually the UK picks up the slack a lot when the US stumbles on regulations and stuff like that. So it's going to be very interesting to see if a lot of bigger companies do move to the UK and if they are very supportive, especially with everything going on at the moment with um, Coinbase, for example, right? It's talking yeah. about moving offshore. And I think they're setting up, did they did they say Bahamas or is it somewhere else in the Car- Caribbean that they're going to set up in? I haven't seen where they've said they're going yet other than, yeah, they're suing the SEC and talking about if we don't get clear guidelines, we're out of the US, yeah. Which makes sense, to be honest. <laughs> it's yeah. like, why would you stay in a country that's basically just doing everything they can to hinder your progress? Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how that ends up playing out for sure. But like you said, Bali is another example, Dubai. 100%. So, uh, Now, there's a good segue there. You mentioned Raul Paul and talking about the 70s and investment banks. So I guess we want to try and give people a five-minute history lesson of what's happening and how we got here. And honestly, if you can understand this, you're ahead of 99% of people that don't understand what's going on under the hood at the moment. So you remember back in the 30s when they rolled out Glass-Steagall, this act to protect um, customers, deposits and banks and saying, hey, we need to separate commercial banking for the purposes of business lending and um, you know mortgages and for people just to have their savings with investment banking and you guys want to speculate and over the next decades and whatnot the banks um, you know they lobbied harder and harder and they chipped away at this regulation until it all got repealed I think in the 90s and so now you basically have this situation where all these customers are going in and your, your money is effectively no longer yours you're signing over to the bank and they can do what they want with it so there's different countries that have different rules about how hey, you have to have a certain amount of capital on hand at any given time, a fractional reserve of that for people that do want to deposit in everyday transactions. Um, they like people to hold a certain amount of government bonds, for example, so they view safer. But then people can go out and, and speculate these banks. And that's what we've seen. Other banks like Silvergate end up heavily in the tech sector or the crypto sector. So when one sector gets hit hard and you know, down 50%, all of a sudden, if depositors get scared and they say, hey, we want to take out our money, all the assets that they're sitting on, they go, well, we don't, we've only got a fraction of what people are trying to withdraw. We're going to sell those, but now the price has fallen 50%. And so that's kind of what happened, has been happening with these banks so far, um, particularly with other things now like <clears throat> commercial uh, real estate and all these commercial mortgage-backed securities. If you've watched all the documentaries about the JFC and you remember how they package them all together and say, hey, these have got a, these have got a great yield, but really now prices are starting to go down. Um, buildings are empty, so they're not collecting rent, so they can't pay these yields. And a lot of the people that were speculating on these things thinking, hey, this is a great way to get 5%. Well, now interest rates are up at 5%. You can get 5% risk-free on a government bond now or in the savings account. So people are going, hey, no need to speculate on these risky things. And they've also fallen 50% in price when people are trying to pull their money out and go, hey, let's go to this safer place or this safer bank, this safer option. So I guess that's kind of briefly what's happening. And it's only really started in a few of these other sectors like commercial real estate. We're seeing some of the big names on Twitter saying, hey, we think this is going to go down and let's buy some put options or short this stock. So in the past, we've seen bans on shorting of bank stocks um, in, in Europe and places like that. So that's kind of the next thing that we're waiting to see, the dominoes falling. So regulators have come out and said, hey, all depositors are going to be safe. But we've also launched this um, bank term uh, lending program, basically so someone like JP Morgan can come in and say, hey, if we scoop up um, these failed banks, you've, we'll give you a loan for, let's say they're still worth 100 cents on the dollar. Let's say that these th- toxic assets haven't fallen 30, 50% or whatever. So they're getting a great deal. They basically have no loss. They get free money that the Fed are printing out of thin air, but they're saying, oh, this isn't QE or money printing again. This is just a one-year loan. But if we go into recession and things get worse, you know they're going to be even more underwater a year or so down the track. So 
did that all make sense? Um, do you have any other questions about this stuff or anything I missed or anything like that, Kyle? No, I think you nailed it, to be honest. Cool, cool. So hopefully everyone at home got that as well, but that leads us to maybe having a look at a few of these charts or any other thoughts you've got off the top of your head. This is why people are liking gold. If they're going to end up having to print trillions of dollars when all these mortgages and commercial real estate and all that to make up the dollar the, the dollar value to, for them to get absorbed, you know, does the Fed's balance sheet go up $5, 10000000000000 trillion? And I think that would just be super, super bullish for, for Bitcoin as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean... It's looking like the Federal Reserve are just so far behind the eight ball, you know, all the way from the start. You know, they took too long to raise. Now they're probably taking, they're probably raising too much or they've taken too long to raise enough to actually make an impact. Uh, and then now they're going to take too long probably to start cutting as well, uh, especially if they wait until next year or they wait until inflation is all the way down at 2% or 3% until they start cutting. You know, and then we're going to end up in a bad recession and it's, you know, then they're going to have to print heaps of capital to get us out of that bad recession uh, and bring unemployment back down. So they're expecting unemployment to go up to 4.5% by the end of this year. Um, you know, if that starts to spiral out of control a little bit higher by the start of 2024, then yeah, we're going to have to have QE come back in, which means price of Bitcoin is going to go up very aggressively. Price of gold is going to go up very aggressively as well because they're the two, uh, you know, main key inflation hedges, right? Absolutely. And unemployment's always low at the start of a recession. You know, it's um, got to, it's got to get worse as we go into that recession. And I think things like unemployment and misleading, we've spoken about how it's re reported these days. I think a lot of people are working that second job or, you know, the Ubers and that kind of thing, even that gig economy mm -hmm people getting paid less than they used to because so many people are looking to pick up some extra hours now. Uh, and yeah, I read that stat the other day, 50% of Americans are looking to use things like buy now, pay later and take out loans and that just to pay for their food and you know, everyday cost of living sort of items. So that's really scary when they say, oh, you know what, I'm going to take take out this loan. And these loans are you know 20% like credit card sort of stuff. This isn't low interest rate loans. And so if yeah. they have all these now and they're for a year, whatever, three years, and we go into this recession and things get worse, that's when things really hit the fan quickly. Yeah, it completely destroys you when you get trapped in that cycle of 20%. Like you just can't escape it and you're going to be in debt forever basically, exactly. which is which is a very scary place, you know, to see so many people, 50% of the population having to rely on that sort of stuff at the moment. So, yeah, basically we need QE um, to save everybody's ass, but uh, we can't have it just yet because inflation is still too high, right? So, yeah, in a bit of a bind. And I think that's when people are going to get angry and people say, oh, well, when is that, when is that going to happen? But look, you know, who would have said streets of France, you know, people setting police on fire yesterday and things like that. So it's kind of happening in slow motion, these protests and people getting upset and starting to realize that it's all just unfair and they're getting further behind. Mm -hmm. So maybe coming to a country near you, but we'll see. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you know, what's happening in France is crazy at the moment. And they're saying that it's because of, um, you know, the, they're raising the retirement age, but I'm not 100% sold on that. <laughs> I think there's lots of other factors after the past few years that people are upset with politicians. Yeah, especially now some of them are starting to do a 180 in, in Canada, Justin Trudeau. Oh, we, you know, we, we never said uh, you had to, had to get it or we never put in these mandates and stuff. And that just makes people angrier. So, mm. yeah. Crazy. <laughs> All right. Do you want to uh, show us some of the charts and the relationships here, stock market and some of the bank stocks and gold? Yeah, sure thing. Let me get uh, share screen up. All right. So this is the regional banking sector ETF. Uh, I mean, this is on a fairly high time frame. Let's go down to the daily. But you can see uh, things looking all pretty normal and then around the 7th of February just fell off an absolute cliff. And we have, we're starting to have that second sort of dip now as well, which this is basically an aggregated chart of a lot of the regional banks. You know, So it's an ETF. Hopefully everybody understands what that is. Um, but... Uh, basically, you know, it's it's looking pretty nasty. Like, you know, that's about as bearish as you can get. Can, you know, it's tried to put in some sort of a flag pattern here. So really big dump off, 
you know, the Federal Reserve came out and said we're going to save all these banks and everybody's insurance is going to be, uh, deposits are going to be insured and everything like that. It's just sort of chopped sideways and, you know, obviously the entire sector has just continued to get weaker and, you know, we're having another big dump off after FRC has gone under and Pac West as well over the last couple of days. So on big volume there as well, yeah. How much more downside there is there. So what would you say? On, on big volume as well. Yeah, I mean, look at this big spike in volume and that's obviously come in because there's so much attention can brought into this sector uh, recently, right? So uh, let's get a look at um, Pac West because I had that up before. Right, so this was one that obviously did very badly when um, you know all the, when Signature and um, Silicon Valley Bank and all those went under as well at the start of March, and then you know down here was when we sort of were expecting the recovery to kick in after the Federal Reserve backed all the banks. But um, you know, and I've seen a lot of people talking about Pac West as one of the banks that you know was fine up until just the other day, but. I mean, this really copped it when the entire sector took a hit and, you know, it sort of just rolled over again in the last few days. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what to say. This entire sector is just looking pretty horrific at the moment. Um, and we can have a look at Perth Republic, which has um, been on the brink for a while. That's on the right chart. Yeah, I think... Maybe that, the chart's uh, gone. Another thing to mention here is um, whether or not they come out and um, announce some sort of rescue package over a weekend. Is First Republic not trading anymore, so you can't get the chart maybe? Yeah, I don't know. I think that might be what it is, but, I mean, this is basically what it looks like. on. Um, <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what BMV is. I think it's like, I don't know. Indian stock exchange or something going on there. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, this is the outline of the chart. Basically, you can see the huge dump through here. And yeah, they got finished off over the last couple of days as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, gold was the other one that we wanted to have a look at. So this is the gold chart and uh, just had a really nice move up to the previous all-time high up here. A bit of rejection today has been selling off fairly aggressively, to be honest. Uh, and that might just be because, you know, we've already had such a strong rally from November last year, all from the bottom of the range here all the way up. And this was a really nice accumulation pattern through here, right? And you take out the lows, right? these levels through here get swept, right? And then you reclaim this level through here. And a lot of times when that happens, the chart will push the price up to the other side of the range, right? So it's, you know, perfect little uh, spring action in your wick off accumulation, right? Or this is a reaccumulation, let's be honest, because uh, this is, you know, a decade long almost uh, accumulation down here. And then we had the markup. And this just looks like a reaccumulation. So this might take a little while to get out from the previous all-time high. Uh, so we could end up just seeing this chop for a little bit through here and form some sort of nice bullish bull flag structure before it breaks out. I mean, it might not take until September. Um, don't worry about the timeline. But I could see something like this here happening. Uh, but, yeah, that just looks like uh, we've made uh, three highs. Right, so first high, second high, third high, and a lot of time you'll see this happen. You get divergence on the uh, RSI, right? Let me get this. Whoops. Hang on. All right, so we can see here that the RSI is making lower lows, right? And this is making higher highs. So you know, you'd say that that is a three push divergence into the previous all-time high, that might uh, be required to come back a little bit. Unless, you know, we do see a whole heap more banks go under over the next few days and it ends up just pushing it straight out at the top. So that's the thing to watch for sure. And then one of the other keys will be to see RSI has made a breakout through here, this downtrend on the RSI. If that gets back above um, 
uh, above into the over, overbought area, above the 70 range, and we make a new high above the pivot here, this could just go into a whole new cycle. And, you know, instead of being in a, in a weak position, it's actually signaling that we're in uh, a maximum strength position. It can push for a long time, right? Sort of similar how we saw back here, it was overbought for a while. But typically gold doesn't like to stay in the overbought area for too long. Right. Whenever it does get there, it does usually pull back fairly quickly. Right. So it does have a little bit of a push left to go. So let's just see how it plays out. But I think most likely uh, this could continue to flag and build up a little bit like of a spring action before uh, we push out. So. And how does that relate to Bitcoin? Because I see a similar thing could happen. If gold's going to do that, it wouldn't surprise me after Bitcoin's had a pretty decent run this year. Um, f for it to chop around for a little bit now as well. Right, so I'll show you the significance of this on, uh, on the lower time frame. Right, so this is my low time frame chart and I look at the session. So each bracket through here is either the London, New York or Asia session, right? Uh, and it's just good to like sort of watch and see what the stock market is doing. So this is the SP 500 here, which is CME uh, E-mini ES. Uh, this is gold in the middle. And then we've got Bitcoin over here. Okay. So we can see here um, that in the previous session, usually the way it works is if the stock market dumps off like this, crypto and Bitcoin will also dump off. And it's been like that for almost two years now especially since we're in the bear market and, you know, even before that, for a lot of the bull market, it was similar as well. Uh, since COVID, you'd probably almost say. Uh, but we can see here, as the stock market was selling off aggressively, gold rallied quite aggressively and Bitcoin also rallied quite aggressively. Whereas previously, any type of sell-off like this, which is a fairly large sell-off, that's, you know, almost 70 points on the SPX, uh, that will... you. It, I've, I, let's just say for more than a few years, I haven't seen an aggressive sell-off in the SPX like that and Bitcoin at, at minimum not sell-off, let alone maybe go sideways. The last few months, we have seen a few times the stock market dumping really aggressively and Bitcoin going sideways for a little bit while that was happening. And then when the stock market recovered, Bitcoin would then recover from there. But I haven't seen it dumping aggressively and Bitcoin pumping aggressively. And that happened a couple of days ago as well uh, in this dump, right? We can also see uh, when this dump happened at the start of the New York session, right? We saw gold uh, gold pump with Bitcoin pump and SPS, SPX sell off quite aggressively. Uh, and when that happened, I was... I was talking to all the guys um, and I was basically saying this is one of the first times I've seen that happening a long time and then it did it again the next night as well. So really interesting to see that starting to play out. And if gold does run and, um, you know, chop sideways here for a couple more weeks and then breaks out to new all-time highs, uh, that, in my opinion, if we do stay, stay the high correlation to gold, it's probably going to make, uh, it's probably going to drag cryptocurrency up with it and we pushed to you know to new new highs potentially on Bitcoin. Um, you know I'd be looking at uh, this level here at about thirty eight to get hit. To be honest, which is pretty much the consolidation level. I go out to a higher time frame. It's a bit easier to see. Pretty much the previous consolidation that we had in the middle of the bear market before that sell off, right? So gold breaks out. I'm going to be looking for this to get tagged. Um, for BTC and then potentially the next level after that, I think, which we could hit this year is up here at um, pretty much 47, 48K, okay? Beautiful. So Bitcoin chopping sideways through here looks very similar to gold at the moment and we could end up just doing something like this when gold breaks out. Perfect. Sound good? The last thing I was, can you just bring up uh, US 10-year yield? Yep. Yeah, can we? And I guess that's what we're talking about the Fed hiking and are they done? And even if they're not done, they're not going to go too um, too much more aggressively. So we've really seen from um, coming up to what's that nine months now since yields peaked, and uh, a lot of investors taking advantage of that and locking in that risk-free high 
high rate and um, coming down as more people want to seek this safety or even with the bailouts that the, the Fed are backstopping and they're kind of forcing people to hold more bonds or they want banks holding more of those safe assets versus those risky assets. So more and more people are having to run in and, and buy treasuries, which pushes down that yield. Yeah, very, very interesting to see how it's all playing out, that's for sure. Awesome. That's all from me, mate. That's all from you in terms of the charts? Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. I will stop that. Perfect. Back to you and I. Awesome, mate. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. Um, anything? Any other closing thoughts or anything like that, mate? Uh, I mean, look, the, the major thing to watch at the moment, I think, uh, is the Apple earnings coming out tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be 4 p.m., so cl- basically the last hour of trading uh, at the close for the, U- the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Apple's going to be releasing their earnings. They're the last one of the big boys. So far, all the earnings have been pretty good. Uh, and if Apple has good earnings as well, then you know the stock market might be all right for a little while longer. If it can shrug off this banking sector collapse again, which most likely it will, um, the stock market might be all right for a little bit longer. But yeah, if Apple does have poor earnings, which you know there's a bit of talk and rumor about because of low sales of uh, MacBook and iPhone at the moment, uh, that could end up being you know causing a little bit of a scare and sell-off because, you know, they are the biggest company at the moment on the stock market and hold one of the largest weightings. So it could be a bit of a signal that we are starting to head into a recession. I think that could cause a bit of fear. So that's probably the main thing to keep our eyes on for the next few days. I'd be super interested to see um, if they share any forecasts on the amount of people that have started to use that Apple interest savings account. Now these banks are collapsing as well as a bit of a, hey, tech slowing down but we got x amount it's probably too early to report the numbers but even just some forecasts or commentary around um, our new high interest banking service has been really popular and something else that they can start to clip fees and make revenue from i'd be interested to see if we see anything like that popping up yeah Definitely. Yeah, that'll be a big thing to watch for, especially over the next few uh, earnings reports as well, because I think that's just only going to grow, right? And that could maybe inspire a new wave of, um, of growth for them. And they're not too far off previous all-time high as well, the COVID all-time high. So, And something else yeah. to be scared of, I think, when the biggest company in the world that owns all the technology is now getting into banking and finance to that degree. So, Right. Yeah, pays to have some tinfoil around these days with the way the world's <laughs> playing out. Right. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed that chat. Uh, links to all Kyle's socials will be down below as well as mine and our premium group and whatnot. So we'll have to do this again soon, Kyle. Thanks, mate. Thanks a lot, mate. Chat soon. Cheers, guys.